Welcome everyone from across the world. Uh, and thank you for joining Health for the World Ground Round. Today I'll be moderating this fantastic lecture and I have the honor of introducing our speaker, Dr. Neil Hansen. Dr. Hansen is an Associate Professor of Radiology and the Director of Computer Tomography at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Um, he specializes in abdominal imaging and nuclear medicine and today he's going to lecture on CT and geography of the aorta and extremities. Uh, Dr. Hansen, thank you so much for joining us. It's such an honor to have you with us today, and we're looking forward to hearing your lecture. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the introduction, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk. So, uh, can, as uh, was stated, I'm going to be talking about CT angiography right now, some of the more vascular applications of it, and uh, we'll kind of just dive right in. I don't have any disclosures. Also, uh, for a shameless plug, if someone is looking for kind of basic radiology educational content here at the University of Nebraska, we do have a YouTube channel, which has uh, a basics physics curriculum, as well as it has uh, some basics on how to interpret various studies, mostly CT, but also MRI, kind of a how to approach a CT urography, how to approach CT colonography, how to approach an MRCP. Um, kind of short little five to 10 minute videos, as well as longer lectures. So feel free to check out uh, the YouTube video, uh, Neil Hansen, for uh, some more educational videos, if that is something that's of interest to you. The outline for this talk, I uh, got about 45 minutes of uh, kind of didactics, and then we'll have questions for 15 minutes, if some questions should arise. Uh, but basically, I'm going to talk about image acquisition parameters and indications for CT angiography, starting with a basic aorta CT, moving on to the acute aorta and post-operative aorta, looking at post-endograft evaluation, as well as upper and lower extremity runoffs. I'll briefly touch on microvascular flap evaluation, which we do here, as well as kind of venous imaging, and then go over some uh, both easy and uh, more difficult uh, and challenging cases from CT angiography. So why should be, you be interested in this? Well, really technological advances, even in kind of older CT scanners now, have allowed uh, conventional catheter-based angiography uh, to be replaced really for many and most diagnostic applications. CT is less invasive, there's less vascular complications, there's less risk to the patient, it's oftentimes faster and a better study. CT can also look for different etiologies of patient symptoms uh, versus catheter angiography really is just looking at the vasculature. And then really, if we do a good job on this, it'll ensure a bright future, more research, more work in the area. So for the basic aorta CT, uh, you get your standard scout radiographs of the area of interest. In this case, we're looking at the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. There's really no need for oral prep, so there's no oral contrast given. Depending on your CT scanner, you know, hopefully you uh, have a CT scanner that can do this within a single breath hold. Uh, it requires a pretty heavy dose of iodine. So traditionally you'd give 100 to 120 cc's of a very concentrated uh, iodinated contrast, like 300 milligrams per milliliter or above. Here we use a contrast agent that's 370 milligrams per milliliter. You want to do thin section imaging, so something on the order of 1.25 uh, millimeter sections so that you can do 3D reconstructions uh, if needed. And then uh, most places will do some sort of a uh, smart prep, so like a smart prep looking where you put a region of interest in the aorta, and then when the contrast bolus reaches maximum pacification, it's often triggered at 150 to 180 Hounsfield units, then you do your scan. If you don't have smart prep technology available, you can do it just by timing. And depending on the scan setup, it might be different times everywhere. So, you know, you might be at a 15 minute scan, a 20 minute scan, you might have to experiment if you're using fixed dose uh, timing. I'm sorry, I should have said 15 to 20 seconds, not 20 minutes. Obviously, the arterial phase is in seconds. Uh, so here's an example of a good CT angiogram where you have maximum opacification of the aorta, where that's the brightest thing on the screen. You have really thin section imaging, so you can get a 3D reconstruction of the entire aorta and pelvic arterial runoff. And you can do multiplanar reformats here, 
looking at like the, I like to call this like the oblique sagittal or a candy cane view of the heart here or uh, of the aorta in the chest. Uh, for gating, uh, you may not be fortunate enough to work at a place that has ECG gating, uh, but if you do, it's very, very useful for getting still images of the aorta. It can prevent motion artifacts and give you much better, uh, more accurate measurements, especially of places that are inherently affected by motion, like the ascending aorta. You can do both retrospective gating and prospective gating. Prospective gating is timed uh, based off of, uh, you know, the ECG that's hooked up to the patient to only image during the down portion of the cardiac cycle versus retrospective gating. You kind of image throughout the cardiac cycle and then selectively go back and use the images acquired during that down portion. Both work well. Uh, the advantage of prospective gating is less radiation dose, uh, but it also is a lot more technically challenging. So uh, if you have gating available, uh, it may be retrospective and that's just fine. Should you gate? Really, uh, you should if you're imaging in the chest, uh, if it's available. Looking at the aortic root, the ascending thoracic aorta, you can avoid motion artifacts. Artifactual uh, apparent dissection flaps are fairly common to see. So it really prevents those and gives you the opportunity to maximally benefit. I find ECG gating to be a little less needed when you're just focused on abdominal and pelvic uh, imaging. You know, the radiation dose for prospective gating, if you have it available, is uh, substantially less than retrospective gating. So that's one of the advantages. So the basic aorta CT, what do we use it for? You can use it for following up known aneurysms or dissections. You can use it for preoperative or pre-interventional planning, like if an endograft is going to be placed or a AAA repair is going to be done. You can use it in the setting of trauma to work up vascular injury. You can look at vasculitis. So if you're looking at Takayasu's uh, vasculitis or some other large vessel vasculitis or even medium vessel vasculitis, uh, you can evaluate for uh, complications and disease status. So here's an example case. This is a 58-year-old female who presented with uncontrolled hypertension. We did a CT angiogram of the abdomen and pelvis. This is a coronal reformat. And you can see here, the left renal artery has this abnormal kind of saccular and beaded appearance. I'll go ahead and scroll through. And I want you really to focus right here on the left renal artery, where the aorta looks normal. The left renal artery at its takeoff is normal, but then there's this abnormal beaded appearance of the left renal artery. And this is a case of fibromuscular dysplasia. So eventually this patient went and had to be treated with angioplasty, but we were able to make the diagnosis non-invasively um, uh, without uh, needing to do arterial punctures. Uh, so it's, you know, you can oftentimes uh, exclude or diagnose FMD using just routine uh, aortic CT. So the next protocol I'm kind of touching on is the acute or post-operative aorta. And really the protocol is almost exactly the same. We just add in a non-contrast series. And why do you do that? A non-contrast series is really helpful in the acute aortic setting, looking for an acute intramural hematoma. And in the post-operative setting, it's really helpful in identifying post-operative material like pledgets, suture material. Sometimes vascular anastomoses are done with this felt material that is hyperdense on CT. So that's really where we usually do it. We always use it for our initial post-operative follow-up, as well as the uh, emergent chest pain patient or emergent abdominal pain patient in our emergency room that is suspected to have an acute aortic syndrome. So here's our case for the acute aortic protocol. It's an 81-year-old male who has chest pain. Here we have the non-contrast images of the uh, chest through the ascending thoracic aorta. And you can see here, there's a crescentic area of high attenuation in the ascending thoracic aorta. Here's the post-contrast arterial phase. And I've always found it a lot more difficult to appreciate how hyperdense that uh, crescentic thickening is um, if you actually have contrast on board. I think it's a lot easier to see on this non-contrast image. And it's the reason that we do it as part of the acute aortic protocol. Also, if you look at the pericardium, there's a pericardial effusion that is not simple. It's 70 Hounsfield units. So it's uh, compatible with blood products. So they have hemopericardium as well as this crescentic uh, 
uh, abnormality in the wall of the ascending aorta. Here's the non-contrast images. I'll kind of slowly scroll through, and I want you to really concentrate on that ascending thoracic aorta. You can see here in the distal uh, ascending aorta near the arch is where it kind of starts and it extends all the way down to the aortic root and the sinotubular junction. So the diagnosis here was an acute intramural hematoma. Uh, they actually had uh, some rupture with hemopericardium. Unfortunately, this patient later on died. Uh, once you have hemopericardium, you know, you can get cardiac tamponade and it's really a, a, an emergent situation. But an intramural hematoma kind of at its basics of pathology is kind of a bleed into the uh, wall of the aorta and it causes, um, you know, that high attenuation thickening because there's blood products that are hyperdense on CT. And eventually, you know, if this ruptures, uh, as was this case, if this, you know, intimal layer ruptures and you bleed into your hemo or bleed into your pericardium, uh, that's a life-threatening emergency. So again, like I think these intramural hematomas are a lot easier to see on non-contrast than on the post-contrast arterial phase of imaging. Also, here's an example of a patient that had a prior ascending thoracic aortic repair. So if you look at the aorta CT, you see this hyperdense material around the aortic graft in place and this little outpouching. And I've seen several cases here of uh, people in our town uh, radiologists that have called these small pseudoaneurysms or extravasated contrast. And really, it's easy to prove they're not because if you look at the non contrast scan, they're inherently hyperdense prior to the arterial phase of imaging. And what they are is these are just little pledgets. This is a pledget at a cannulation site for the prior cardiac bypass. And this is the felt material that's used to wrap around the graft and sew it in place. So it's really a normal post operative finding. All right, the next uh, protocol we're talking about is the post-endograft aorta CT. So if someone is known to have an aortic endograft, we do the non-contrast CT, the arterial phase CT, and then add, add in a third run, which is our delayed phase, which is usually about 90 to 120 seconds after contrast is administered. And we get that because these delayed images improve detection of slow flow endoleaks that are seen during that arterial phase of imaging. So here's case three. This is a 39-year-old male whose status post a left external iliac artery debranching procedure, had a complex endograft place for a thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm and a dissection. So here's what an endograft looks like, this high attenuation material within the aortic lumen. Uh, this is the arterial phase of imaging where you can see we have maximal pacification and density within the aortic lumen. And then here's the delayed post-contrast series here. And as you look at these images, on the non-contrast series, the excluded part of the aneurysm sac here is hypodense, so it's low attenuation. During the arterial phase, there's a faint blush of uh, contrast pacification you can see here. It's kind of very difficult to see though. I'm hopefully on your monitor, you can kind of see it, but it's very, very subtle. And then on the delayed um, images done about 90 seconds later, there's really a lot of contrast in the excluded portion of the aneurysm sac, which is consistent with an endoleak. Um, really, it's hard to make this diagnosis confidently uh, without this delayed series. So that's why it's part of the endograph protocol. If we scroll through here, this case, uh, you can see here, this is the arterial phase of imaging. And if you just look at the excluded part of the aneurysm sac, there's uh, really only uh, minimal high attenuation products in it. It's very difficult to see any endoleak at this time. But if we scroll through the more delayed series, you can see here, kind of starting up here, there's this contrast that's collecting as it should not. So in a normal endograph, you won't see any contrast collecting in the excluded uh, part of the endograft if it's working well. And you can see here that this is confirmatory of an endoleak. This is actually a type two endoleak. Many endoleaks in the abdominal uh, cavity are caused by these lumbar collateral vessels, these small arteries, which can feed into the aneurysm sac and uh, cause it to even enlarge if they provide enough flow to it. So that was a type two endoleak from a lumbar collateral vessel. It was treated with an endovascular occlusion 
so our interventional radiologists will go in and they'll uh, occlude these lumbar collateral vessels to prevent that aneurysm sac from enlarging any further. Endo leaks, um, you know, there's various types. A type one endo leak is when there's a poor seal of the endograft proximally. Very rare to see that on CT angiogra angiography, although we do see a couple a year. Uh, and it's rare to see them because usually the surgeon will fix them at the time of endograft placement. By far and away, the most common endo leak we see is a type two, which is via these lumbar collaterals, or I've seen some with backflow via the internal or the inferior mesenteric artery. Type three is kind of a break in the graft. So sometimes there are overlapping graft components, or sometimes the components will break and it's inherent leak from the graft itself. And then a type four is kind of a, a porous graft material, or some people will even classify further into another type, an endotension type of uh, leak. Those are pretty rare to see in our practice. All right, post endograft aortic CT. So that's the non contrast, basic aorta, and the delay the delay being used to identify endo leaks. Here's another example where you don't see the endo leak on the non contrast. You can faintly see it during arterial phase, and then it gets bigger and more apparent on the delayed phase. All right, three phases is lots of radiation, right? Um, and, you know, especially in younger patients, you're going to want to be conscious of uh, radiation effects. There are different technologies which you may or may not have available, like dual energy. We have dual energy scanners, so we can create those virtual non-contrast images. If you're lucky enough to work at a place with a dual energy scanner, you should really look into creating these virtual non-contrast images because it can lower your radiation dose. You can also do um, uh, different radiation dose uh, reduction uh, strategies like using iterative reconstruction. If you work on an older CT scanner, most of them have filtered back projection for their radiation uh, or for their imagery construction uh, modality. Uh, but if you're lucky enough to work at a place with iterative reconstruction, like uh, we have GE here, so we use uh, actually Acer V, which is a, a kind of adaptive uh, statistical way to uh, recreate images. But using these for these very high radiation studies is very beneficial. All right, now I'm going to move on to the technical aspects of lower extremity runoff CT angiography. So um, here are some scout radiographs, which you can use to plan. Uh, the protocol is a little bit different here. So normally we have the toes together pointed up. We'll even put a little bit of like a coband or some sort of material around the patient's feet to hold them in that position, because especially older or sick patients have trouble maintaining that position. Uh, we put blood pressure cuffs on the proximal thighs and we'll inflate them to 60 millimeters of mercury. That's uh, you know done to help create maximum opacification and decrease venous contamination. We do an arterial scan for this lower extremity runoff. We do it from the liver all the way through the feet. Uh, and the, the imaging parameters are somewhat similar to a regular aorta. So we're gonna use thin section images so we can do 3D reconstructions. So usually like 1.25 millimeters or less. We'll use a very dense contrast. So we use 350 milligrams per milliliter. Really for iodine, uh, you'd wanna use at least 300 milligrams per milliliter. Give a pretty big dose, 100 to 120 cc's and inject it fairly rapidly at four milliliters per second. Uh, we also chase it with a 50 uh, cc normal saline bolus to help kind of push it through the vasculature. We use a smart prep. Again, you can either do a some sort of a uh, timed uh, scan using like a smart prep with a region of interest in the aorta. We do it at the celiac level. Although if you don't have a smart prep available, you can experiment with your scanner and do a fixed time uh, dosage. Uh, and then we also always do a delayed scan. So here's where our kind of blood pressure cuffs go. And then this is where we do a delayed scan. So we do the whole arterial phase. And then about 12 seconds later, we'll do from two centimeters above the patella through the feet again. And why do we do that? Well, it's because inherently a lot of these patients have bad atherosclerotic vascular disease. A lot of them have flow limiting stenosis. A lot of them have bad cardiac output. And we find that doing this delayed scan allows us to 
time every individual a little bit uh, differently. Some people, if they have really good cardiac output, you can get a great scan on the initial arterial phase. But some people, especially if they have a really tight stenosis, like in their superficial femoral artery, or um, if they have bad cardiac output, they might not opacify the arteries in their lower extremities and feet for many seconds after what a normal person was. Uh, and then it can be difficult. So if the contrast bolus doesn't arrive by the time you scan, you don't know if a vessel is occluded. You don't know if it's just slow flow. You don't know if it's just really calcified. So that's why you can't see it. So this delayed scan is really essential in a lot of cases, especially vasculopaths, to uh, get an accurate diagnosis. Right here's an example of the lower extremity runoff uh, CTA. And if it's done well, uh, you get great opacification here of like the popliteal arteries. You can see the anterior tibial, posterior tibial, and peroneal arteries, all three vessels in terms of runoff in the calf to the foot. And you can make great looking 3D reconstructions from the aorta all the way down through the level of the ankle. For our reporting procedures, we really just take it uh, step by step. So we describe the aorta, all the visceral branch vessels, then we go down and do the right pelvic sides, you know, common iliac, internal and external iliac arteries. And then we describe the vasculature of the thigh, calf, all the way down to the feet to three vessel runoff. Because ideally you'd have three vessel runoff to the feet via your anterior tibial, posterior tibial and perineal arteries. All right, here's our case. So this is a 20 year old male who is in a motor vehicle collision. So we start with a plain radiograph of the knee. And you know, as you look at it, you can tell that the patella is uh, superiorly uh, dislodged and that the uh, femur and the tibia are, look malaligned. When you look at a lateral radiograph, it becomes apparent that there's a complete dislocation at the knee joint. Anytime you see a complete dislocation at the knee joint, you have to be worried about injury to the structures that run behind the knee joint which are the popliteal artery. Uh, so at our institution, whenever someone has a knee dislocation, we follow it up essentially immediately uh, with a lower extremity runoff CT angiogram. And you can see here in this case, uh, the patient actually at this point in time had an external fixator in place, uh, but um, they, uh, they had adequate opacification of the popliteal artery just above the knee joint. And then as you get to the knee joint level, there's complete occlusion of that popliteal artery. And uh, I'll scroll through it here because I think it's easier to see dynamically, but you can go ahead and look at the popliteal artery as I'm going down, 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 down. And then even though the knee has been reduced and relocated at this time and is no longer dislocated, that arterial injury um, caused an ischemic foot. So they had a complete occlusion of the popliteal artery. Uh, which was related to a traumatic focal dissection that thrombosed off. Uh, this patient uh, did have a good outcome, but it required an open vascular bypass of the popliteal artery uh, to salvage the limb. So lower extremity runoff CTA, what do we use it for? We use it for evaluation of claudication and peripheral vascular occlusive disease. That's probably the most common thing we do, uh, especially in smokers, people that have very bad atherosclerotic vascular disease, We'll do it to assess for preoperative planning. Uh, you know, the vascular surgeons need to know, do they need to do a bypass, like a FEMPOP bypass, or do they need to do something else like a uh, uh, potentially a stent placement? We look for assessment of traumatic injury or an emergent cold foot. So if someone presents with a cold foot, maybe there's a concern for a thromboembolic phenomenon, or maybe they had a gunshot wound or a stabbing penetrating injury to the leg. We'll do it uh, prior to operative intervention to assess the degree of traumatic injury. And then we'll do post-operative assessments to evaluate bypass grafts. So sometimes on ultrasound, it's unclear if a bypass graft is open or not, or it's unclear the degree of partial thrombosis that may be present, or maybe that it's unclear if there's a pseudoaneurysm. For all those reasons, sometimes we need to do a CT angiogram in addition to the ultrasound assessment of a graft. Also, we do uh, fibular graft donation here. So sometimes due to traumatic injuries or tumors, uh, someone, for example, may have to have a severe or advanced mandibular resection and our maxillofacial surgeons will harvest the fibula and use it as a bone graft donor site. Uh, 
and uh, we'll do it for preoperative planning of the vasculature around the fibula so they can uh, do their microvascular anastomoses for those grafts. Also, sometimes we'll do these if someone has a lower extremity sarcoma or something like that. Um, we'll do uh, preoperative planning so that the surgeon can look at the arterial and venous supply of the mass uh, to know what they're getting into prior to the operation for resection of a tumor. All right, now we're going to touch on upper extremity runoff CT angiography. So uh, for this indication, we usually put the person in what we call the swimmer position, which you can see here based on the scout is uh, the arm up position. Uh, you can also use, if you're looking at bilateral upper extremities, what we call the Superman position, where both arms are above uh, the head. And again, just like in the lower extremity runoff, we do both an arterial group, which the arterial scan is from the aortic arch through the fingertips, tips, as well as a delayed group, which looks at the veins, as well as delayed opacification if there's a flow limiting uh, stenosis or other lesion upstream of uh, the hand. So here's where our delayed group is from just above the elbow through the fingertips. Again, we use smart prep, thin section imaging, dense contrast uh, with uh, you know, concentrated iodine and a really rapid uh, intravenous injection. Our delayed scan is just like in the lower extremities, just about 12 to 17 seconds after the contrast bolus or after the arterial face scan. For the upper extremity runoff, uh, we also have a specialized protocol for thoracic outlet syndrome, which is just a modification of the upper extremity runoff. This is to look for thoracic outlet syndrome. We always do both sides because sometimes it's useful to compare the symptomatic side uh, versus the neutral or non-symptomatic side. So we image both in the arms down position and in the arms up Superman position. And we do that because the thoracic uh, outlet can dynamically change with hand positioning. So sometimes someone is asymptomatic at rest, but when their arms are in the above the head position, they will get symptomatic because that thoracic outlet can functionally close. Uh, we use 75 cc's of a very concentrated uh, iodine uh, contrast for each position. So 150 milliliters total, 75 for the right, 75 for the left, uh, doing two separate arterial face scan. And we do this to um, uh, dynamically assess narrowing of the thoracic outlet. I'm sorry, I, the 75 cc's is for the uh, arms down and arms up position, not right versus left. It's for 75 cc's for arms down, 75 cc's arms up for 150 cc's total. All right, so here's case five. This was an 18 year old volleyball player who experienced pain and numbness in fingers after practice. Uh, and this was worse when she would do like over uh, hand overhead exercises. Initially, they were worried about nerve problems. She had a normal uh, nerve conduction study, uh, but proceeded to our institution for a thoracic outlet syndrome workup. On imaging, uh, you can see here on the chest radiograph uh, that if I really zoom in, she had a cervical rib on the right. So you can see a tiny kind of hypoplastic accessory cervical rib which was the reason she had the symptoms. When we scanned her, you can look at the, uh, you know, the functional um, narrowing of the thoracic outlet from arms down position to arms up where that thoracic outlet really becomes significantly narrowed. And as you can see here that, you know, an accessory first rib can uh, narrow the uh, subclavian artery and it can even push on the vein and the nerve running through the thoracic outlet as well. Uh, when it's pinched against the clavicle here. So we'll provide measurements of that thoracic outlet, both in the arms down and arms up position. So here you can see a sagittal image too, where that cervical rib functionally can cause a pretty significant narrowing with the clavicle in the arms up position. To scroll through it, just pay attention to how uh, wide the thoracic outlet is here. Here's that cervical rib. It's pushing up right against the subclavian artery right there in the neutral position. And now in the arms up position, you look at that rib and that becomes much more narrow right there at the thoracic outlet. And uh, that person had a cervical rib resection, which alleviated her symptoms. So upper extremity runoff CT, we use it to assess for traumatic injury. 
Uh, so if someone has a bad compound fracture, maybe had a crush injury to the arm, maybe had a penetrating injury or a shotgun or a, a gun wound uh, to the arm, we'll do it uh, for preoperative planning to assess the degree of vascular injury. Uh, sometimes we've had people present with an acute cold upper extremity. Uh, you know, oftentimes that's related to thromboembolic disease, people that have hypercoagulable disorders. And so uh, we'll do the upper extremity runoff for that reason. We will use it occasionally to look for vasculitis. Uh, so some people have vasculitis with symptoms of like cold fingers uh, or claudication type of symptoms. So we'll look at vasculitis. Uh, we'll do preoperative uh, evaluation of masses again, usually for an extremity sarcoma or something like that. We use it for evaluation of thoracic outlet syndrome, as well as looking at dialysis fistulas. So in our population of end-stage renal disease patients on dialysis, a lot of them have upper extremities, arterial venous fistulas. Uh, these frequently will have complications, uh, narrowings, um, thrombosis, and we'll use upper extremity runoff CT to look at that. Uh, the last uh, kind of protocol I'll kind of mention is pre-op microvascular flap evaluation. Um, you know, we do these uh, reconstruction graphs where most of the time it's a woman getting a mastectomy and a breast implant, uh, breast reconstruction uh, after a mastectomy for cancer. But occasionally we'll do it for other reasons. Maybe someone had a bad trauma and needs a graph. Uh, sometimes uh, people will have uh, really severe surgical resections for tumors and then need a graft. And uh, we'll do a scan looking at the branching pattern of the inferior epigastric vessels to help the surgeon plan out their operation. We map them on 3D reconstructions, looking at how far away they are from the umbilicus to decrease the surgical time uh, needed to find those small perforating arteries. It's really just a modification of our basic aorta protocol use a smart prep with delay. The One of the main differences is we scan from the bottom up. And I'll tell you, if you're working at a place that and having to design some of these protocols, if you're scanning a patient, you're really interested in the pelvic arterial outflow, abdominal wall musculatures, musculatures around the gluteal muscles. Uh, it can be an advantage to scan from the bottom up because you'll avoid some of the venous contamination, get a little bit better crisper arterial phase images, uh, by doing this, um, just because it inherently, especially if you're on an older, slower scanner, takes a while to get, you know, from the chest all the way down to the pelvis if you're doing a complete aortic runoff. So if the area of interest is in the pelvis, uh, you know, or in the proximal uh, lower extremities or in the buttock regions, might want to consider scanning from the bottom up. For these indications, we always scan from the greater trochanter level up to the celiac axis or sometimes all the way up to the aortic arch, depending on what the surgeon needs. And then we just classify the branching pattern of the inferior epigastric arteries to plan their graft placement. This has been proven to decrease operating room times, improve graft viability, and decrease uh, the rate of postoperative hernias after the surgery. For a venous runoff, uh, venous runoff CT is very similar to the arterial runoff in terms of thin section imaging. Uh, but instead of using smart prep, we actually just do a fixed delay. It's very hard to get optimal opacification of the inferior vena cava and the, um, the iliac veins. Uh, and it's different in everybody. In a young, healthy person, it might be at like a minute, 30 seconds. In an older person with uh, bad peripheral circulation or bad cardiac output, it might take you know a full three minutes. So we actually scan twice. We'll scan once around 90 seconds and once at around 180 seconds uh, because it's just so hard to time uh, that we'll give two passes. Uh, really ultrasound, MR venography, conventional venography can give you better imaging for many of these applications for venous runoff CT. However, I'll tell you, we're doing more and more of these um, the last couple of years, and it's because our technology has gotten better. We've gotten better at reading them, and uh, I think we'll use them even more in the future. All right, so we, in summary, have gone over basic aorta CT, acute postoperative aorta, which just adds a non-contrast phase. We've gone over endograft imaging, which is a basic uh, 
uh, ARX CT plus a non-contrast plus a delay. We've talked about lower and upper extremity runoffs, what you might use it for, as well as different technical uh, reasons uh, and modifications that you might uh, utilize to get better imaging. Talked a little bit about microvascular graft evaluation and venous runoff. And now I'm going to use the next 15 minutes to kind of show some, highlight some cases uh, that we've seen using these techniques. So the first case I'm going to do is an 81-year-old male with back pain uh, presented uh, for an acute aorta CT. And you can see here we started with a non-contrast scan. And uh, then we gave an arterial phase scan. And I'll kind of scroll through it here for you. So on this non-contrast scan, you can see there's a large hemorrhage throughout the retroperitoneum, even extending into the abdominal mesentery. They have a large aortic aneurysm. It was well over five centimeters. They've got some displaced intimal calcium, you can see here within the abdominal aortic aneurysm. And hemorrhage even going into the uh, psoas musculature. On the arterial phase of imaging, you can see that there was extravasation of contrast to the right of the aorta. There was really a focal hole in the aorta at the site of aneurysm rupture and retroperitoneal hemorrhage. So this was a case of a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. The patient uh, unfortunately died shortly after the CT, although uh, we have had success at our institution with patients even with as severely um, you know, large hematomas as this surviving endograft placement and open repairs. Here's case seven. This is a 52 year old male with chest pain. And I'll go ahead and just scroll through these for you. Pay attention to the aorta here. So in the aortic arch, there is a dissection flap. It extends all throughout the arch. You can follow the dissection flap all the way down inferiorly into the ascending aorta down to the aortic root. And you can even see it here extending down to the aortic valve plane. When you look at the dissection extension and the descending aorta, it goes down and both the true and false lumens are well opacified with contrast. So when you read these, you really want to describe where the dissection is going, what is covered or uncovered by the dissection flap, what is in the true lumen and in the false lumen, and then how well is the true and false lumen opacified comparatively to each other. So this was a type A dissection, which was treated with an emergent uh, surgical repair. You know, in contrast to the intramural hematoma, the dissection occurs when there's a, you know, a bleed into the intimal layer and there's actually an intimal flap where the intima and media can lift off of the, um, the you know, adventition, create a, a functional dissection flap within the aortic lumen. You know, if you look at it schematically, there's a hole, there's a bleed, the dissection flap lifts off. Uh, new, usually, you know, those serosal layers stay intact, um, so you don't have contrast extravasation outside of the aorta, although that can rupture um, and cause things like chemoperitoneum, just like in an intramural hematoma. Uh, oftentimes, the false lumen is larger and compressing on the true lumen, which can cause flow limitation to the arteries coming off of the aorta. Um, and uh, oftentimes the false lumen is not opacified uh, to the same degree that the true lumen is, although that's not always the case. All right, next case is a 52-year-old female with chest pain. I'm gonna go ahead and scroll through the aorta here. You can see here coming off of the arch of the aorta is a focal saccular outpouching, which goes into the anterior mediastinum. This was the cause of the patient's chest pain. And this was a penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer treated with an aortic uh, endograft. You can see here, endograft covering up that ulcer. Penetrating uh, atheromatous ulcer, again, has really similar risk factors, really similar pathophysiology uh, to the intramural hematoma, as well as the aortic dissection. You know, oftentimes there's severe atherosclerotic plaque that causes kind of a functional hole in the intimal layer, uh, things like hypertension, uh, smoking, you know, they weaken the wall of the aorta and allow for that outpouching of contrast into a penetrating atheromatous ulcer, it can cause pain, and they also unfortunately can uh, rupture and cause the patient to exsanguinate. All right, case nine is a 47-year-old with abdominal pain and a cold left foot 
So if you look here, I'll go ahead and uh, kind of scroll through here. Um, so this was a type B dissection and it originates at the proximal descending thoracic aorta. You can see down here that the dissection uh, flap is kind of plastered up against the wall of the aorta. And most of what you're seeing is actually kind of false lumen that's opacified. The dissection flap goes into the origin of the superior mesenteric artery. It goes into the origin of the celiac artery. As we go down, it's covering up the left renal artery here. If you'll notice the left kidney is not opacified to the same degree as the right. There's a delayed nephrogram on the left. And this is from a dynamic obstruction from this dissection flap, which is compressing up against the ostea of the left renal artery and causing a flow limitation. As I keep going down, you can see the true lumen again is just severely compressed by the false lumen and the dissection flap uh, goes all the way to the aortic bifurcation. So this was a type B dissection with dynamic compression of the left renal artery. Eventually it actually occluded the left common iliac artery. Endovascularly, they had to go in, put in some stents to open up that true lumen and allow adequate flow to the left kidney as well as the left leg. Case 10, this is a 67 year old who is status post aorto by femoral bypass grafting six years ago. Sudden onset of bloody vomiting followed by syncope. So here's the arterial phase of imaging. You can see there's contrast opacification of the aorta, but also this extravasated contrast, which corresponds to the third part of the duodenum. So this was a very large aortoenteric fistula. Uh, very rare to see this on uh, CT um, because oftentimes patients will die when this occurs. They'll exsanguinate from a massive GI bleed. If you look here, this patient was quite sick. They had very poor perfusion of their kidneys with multifocal renal infarcts. So that was an aeroenteric fistula with active bleeding. The patient unfortunately died. This is somewhat of a unicorn in terms of uh, being rare, although I will say that I've diagnosed this probably five or six times in my career, always requires an emergent phone call. Even saw a case, if any of you are working at places that have are endemic um, with uh, bad tuberculosis uh, burden, um, it can be a complication of tubercular involvement of the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, you know, if you think about it, it's literally a hole of the aorta going into the gastric, duodenal, small bowel, lumen, uh, causing a massive GI bleed because this is a low pressure system and a high pressure fit system uh, feeding your blood into a low pressure system is a recipe for disaster. Case 11, this is a 55 year old female status post motor vehicle collision. Here I like to show, so as part of my trauma protocol search pattern, I always look at the aorta in what I call the candy cane view or an oblique sagittal view. And I think it's a lot easier to see that here where you can see this focal contrast outpouching from the aortic isthmus. You can see here on this multiplanar reconstruction that there's a pseudoaneurysm here. And the reason the aorta tears there is because the ligamentum arteriosum attaches there. When there's a sudden stop, you'll get a ripping of the aortic wall in contrast extravasation. I've always found on axial imaging as I scroll through here, it can be kind of subtle where the abnormality really isn't quite as noticeable as I think it is on the candy cane view, and uh, hence my surge pattern. This is actually quite a big uh, aortic transection with pseudoaneurysm, so it's, it's easier to see than some of the ones I've seen. So as an aortic transection, it was treated with an endograph uh, placed. Case 12 is a 69-year-old with a history of sepsis. So here we're at the level of the aortic arch. You can see the ascending aorta, descending aorta arch is just above this. And there's a large uh, outpouching of contrast with contrast extravasation. There's clotted blood in the mediastinum by it. There's complex products within a large pericardial effusion. And this was actually, here you can see the sagittal oblique view, just how big this uh, saccular irregular uh, aneurysm is. I scroll through it, this is actually a septic aneurysm. So this patient was septic, had septicemia, had a uh, infected uh, aorta uh, aneurysm that rapidly got bigger 
uh, and caused a, uh, uh, really it was pus that was in the pericardium uh, when they went in to operate on this person. So was, this was a mycotic aortic arch aneurysm. They had salmonella, bacteremia, and pericarditis. It was treated uh, surgically and of course with antibiotics. The anytime you see an aneurysm that looks like it has a lot of inflammation by it, anytime you have an aneurysm that's rapidly enlarging, you have to stop and include in your imaging differential that this may be a mycotic aneurysm with some sort of infection. The next case, case 13, is a 57 year old with acute onset lower extremity heaviness and poor foot pulses. So, this is an example of a runoff, and I'll go ahead and uh, show the images here. So if you look at the right common iliac artery, well opacified with contrast, this is the arterial phase, should be the brightest thing on the image. And then in the left common iliac artery, it's essentially completely occluded. Uh, the external iliac artery completely occluded. There was really no arterial flow going to the left lower extremity. And then for those of you with a keen eye, you can notice that there is actually clot within the left atrial appendage. It's one of the more common places that we'll see clot that leads to thromboembolic phenomenon. Um, you know, especially in patients that have a dilated cardiomyopathy or atrial fibrillation, they're prone to getting these clots within the left atrial appendage. If you scroll down here, you can see that you have great opacification of the aorta, right common iliac artery, but boom, non-opacification of the entire runoff to the left foot. All right, that patient was treated with an emergent thrombectomy. Got enough time for maybe two or three more cases, so I'll show this one. This is a 25-year-old. The history is, please evaluate the size of the aorta. So here are several axial CT images through the aortic root. You can see there's a significantly enlarged ascending thoracic aortic root, as well as the ascending aorta itself. Then as I scroll down, I want you to just pay attention to the caliber of the aorta. So the arch looks relatively normal caliber. The ascending aorta is quite large, very enlarged at the root. And then the descending aorta starts to become small in uh, smaller in caliber, um, the, uh, or more normal size really. Uh, so anytime you have a aortic root dilation, ascending thoracic dilation, you have to think about a couple of things. One of them is Marfan syndrome and a connective tissue disorder. Another would be like a bicuspid aortic valve or a severe aortic valve stenosis. Um, those are the things you'd want to evaluate. In this case, it was Marfan syndrome treated with an open repair. Next case is a 79 year old male who developed a left lower extremity swelling and pain after a partial uh, penile resection for cancer and a left inguinal lymph node dissection. So if you look here on the arterial phase of imaging, you can see that there's good opacification of the arteries, uh, both the internal and external iliac arteries. Uh, the femoral vein on the right or the common iliac vein on the right is not opacified. But on the left, it is asymmetrically hyperdense. And uh, by the time you get down to the femoral vein, there's really, really strong opacification, which is very abnormal. In the arterial phase of imaging, you really shouldn't have any opacification of the iliac or femoral veins. Uh, and so this was, if I scroll through it, an arteriovenous fistula that developed after the lymph node dissection in the left inguinal station. Um, and it needed to, to be treated uh, operatively. You can even get heart failure if you have a big enough AV fistula um, and uh, poor enough uh, rest or cardiac reserve capacity. Um, and so this was a uh, AV fistula. You can, of course, diagnose this on ultrasound by looking for the classic pseudoaneurysm uh, appearance with kind of the yin yang appearance and the flow above and below the baseline. All right, my time is just about up, so I'm going to show one more case and then stop and open for questions. This is a 68-year-old male with hematuria, buttock pain, difficulties with his love life, um, so he was experiencing uh, impotence. You can see here on this aortic study that the aorta is patent um, at the level of kind of the lower kidneys, but just below this level, it becomes completely occluded. Uh, and then there's really poor to no flow to the iliac system bilaterally, including the internal iliac arteries, uh, 
As a bonus, this person also during the scan, we diagnosed them with a papillary urethelial cancer, uh, which you can see here, this frond-like mass within the posterior bladder wall. If I scroll through the aorta, you can see patent, 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 very atherosclerotic, and then completely occluded. Uh, so this is actually uh, the Reich syndrome. Uh, the Reich syndrome is atherosclerotic aortobiliac occlusive disease with buttock clau claudication and impotence, um, which is uh, exactly what this patient experienced. They also had that invasive papillary urethelial carcinoma. And uh, you can see here on angiography just you know how severely stenotic it was. So I will stop there and open it up for questions with the remainder of my time. Thank you, Dr. Hansen, for the wonderful lecture. This was such a thorough review of city angio of aorta and extremities. Uh, and I encourage everyone to enter your questions in the Q&A box. We already have two questions. The first one is, uh, what is the protocol for upper limb venogram in patients with arteriovenous fistula created for hemodialysis? That's a good question. Uh, we've tried to do some standard CT venograms, uh, and they almost never really work well. Um, where timing the venous uh, opacification of the extremities is very difficult. MR venography, if you have it available, uh, use an MRI is much better. Um, but for the fistulas, we, we actually have had some success. So what we do is a standard arterial phase runoff, and then we'll add on a delayed phase at around 90 seconds. Um, and so most of the time, I'll tell you, if the fistula is open, you'll get opacification of the artery, the graft, as well as the vein all on that first run. But just because we're usually doing them because there's a problem, looking at pseudoaneurysms, looking at uh, occluded grafts, that kind of thing, we find that runoff uh, delay to uh, be helpful in a lot of cases. So we'll do arterial phase, and then we'll do about a 90 second delay. Thank you. The next question is, um, do you use non-contrast CT for evaluation of heavily calcified lower extremities arteries before CTA? Uh, the answer for us is no. Um, uh, one of the reasons uh, that we don't is uh, we have a dual energy scanner. So we can always go back uh, and reconstruct virtual non-contrast images. I know that is a common thing to do uh, for some people's protocol where they will do a, uh, a non-contrast CT. And a lot of times, especially if you're working with an older scanner, um, that uh, you'll get this blooming artifact from the excessive calcifications and it can make it very difficult to assess the degree of uh, stenosis. And CT, if there is one of the pitfalls or bad things about CT, is especially in very calcified arteries, it can cause you to overestimate the degree of stenosis. Usually in those situations, um, you have to kind of go to a more invasive tests like diagnostic angiography with uh, digital subtraction angiography. Uh, that can be beneficial. So we don't routinely do it, although I do know that there are places that will start with that kind of an evaluation uh, looking at it. I find uh, that it's kind of hard to predict which patient is going to have uh, kind of soft plaque versus hard plaque. Um, some patients have this terrible hard plaque with very calcified arteries. Uh, some patients have minimal calcifications, but very severe atherosclerotic vascular disease with soft plaque. Hard to predict beforehand, um, but uh, hopefully that answers your question. So this seems to be the question. Um, thank you again, Dr. Hansen, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, this was a highly educational lecture. Um, thank you. Thank you very much.